All right, James for Beginners, Practical Christianity. This is lesson number five in the series. This lesson's entitled Michael Jackson and James, and we will be covering James chapter two, beginning in verse one, so you can open your Bibles there if you'd like. In uh, Michael Jackson's uh, 1991, that's a long time ago, 1991 album, Dangerous, uh, he does a song entitled Black or White. Remember that? Black or White. And in this song he repeats the words, it doesn't matter if you're black or white. And in it he's promoting the idea that he didn't want to judge or be judged based on his skin color. He didn't want to judge you on your skin color. He didn't want you to judge him on his skin color. And these lyrics, they, they capture the spirit of what James, that's why you know, I copied these, they capture the, the spirit of what James is saying in the section of his epistle which we're going to be studying tonight. The idea being, in the church, it doesn't matter if you're black or white. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, man or woman, Jew or Gentile. We treat everyone in exactly the same way. A good example of how people tend to judge other people by external things appeared on another old TV show. How many remember this? Candid Camera, the old Candid Camera, Alan Funt. Um, uh, uh, this Candid Camera show, as you can see, black and white, uh, it was in the 60s and 70s. It was created and hosted by this fellow uh, called, named uh, Alan Funt. And this was the first program to use a hidden camera to record people who were involved in humorous situations you know, set up by the producers of the show. This is the granddaddy of, of them all. I remember, because I remember seeing this segment. In one segment, they dressed up one of the show's producers to look like a homeless panhandler who was simply trying to get a match to light his cigarette. He had a cigarette in his hand and he was trying to get a light. And, and this was in New York and they put him you know, somewhere in downtown New York and, and, and so they just filmed. And so here's the guy with the cigarette in his hand and he's going, excuse me, just, you know, people just walking around him, you know, just no eye contact, nothing. They just zoom by. And all he wanted was just, he wanted a light. He wasn't even asking for any money. Of course, this is back in the 60s, obviously. Uh, the, the idea about smoking in those days, everybody, everybody smoked in those days. Doctors used to smoke in those days in the hospital. So you know, this was not unusual. So uh, interesting thing. They take, the, uh, they take this fella, they bring him in, same guy, they clean him up, they put a suit on him, shirt and tie, white tie, they bring him back outside and they bring him back exactly on the same spot and they start filming. Wow, first person, sure, you know, absolutely. You know, and they kept filming. And they should, people would say, well, here, take the whole book of matches. You know? And then the, 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 the money shot was at the end, a guy, you know, he, he, this time he tries just to get a cigarette. He goes, uh, excuse me, have you got, have you got a cigarette? And the guy says, oh, sure, you know, he pulls out a cigarette, gives him a cigarette, and then says, take the pack. Take the whole package. Same guy, same guy. Of course, attitudes, as I say, about smoking different today. But the point made was that society usually judges by appearance and treats people accordingly. So in the second chapter of his book, James says that Christians living the Christian way of life are different. They're different because they treat everyone in exactly the same way. The point is that in Christ, we can acknowledge our differences, black or white. You're black, I'm white. We can acknowledge that difference. We don't have to pretend that it doesn't exist. You're rich, I'm poor. You went to university and I didn't. You, you know, you're a doctor and I'm a plumber. You know, we, can, we, can, you know, we can acknowledge those things. We are different. And the reason we can easily acknowledge those differences is because we respond to everybody in the same way. I treat the guy who you know, doesn't have a job to the guy who owns his own company. 
I, I need to be treating those two people in exactly the same way as a Christian. So let's go to chapter two, take a look at how he develops this idea. Chapter two, verse one, he says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. So he begins, it's a command, right? Imperative sentence, do not, he said, do not regard some as more important than others. Then he gives an example, verse two and three. He says, for if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or you sit down by my footstool. So here he gives the example, one's attitude towards rich and poor in church. And of course the example can refer to all differences such as gender or color or handicap or whatever. So he compares, or excuse me, he compares and judges attitude, not differences. Verse four, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? The idea is if you have a different attitude for different people then this type of behavior, he says, is evil. Why? Well, it, because it, it's driven by an evil motive, which is pride or selfishness. Verse five, listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He promised to those who love Him? You know, God's not partial, He loves everybody, and He proves it in the way He has offered salvation and blessings, even to the poorest of people even to those who seem to deserve it least of all, he offers the same blessings. You know, the guy that, who has lived a, a, a life of debauchery for years and years and wasted his potential and spent all his money, you know, and has got nothing left to give to the Lord, but then comes to the Lord. You know, comes to the Lord and finally acknowledges his faith, is baptized, and, yeah, and he receives the blessings of forgiveness and all the blessings of heaven. And then you've got this other fellow who's been serving, you know, baptized at nine years old and been faithful all of his life. And these two here, they're, they're getting the same reward. Remember I, when I talked about Haiti? I said the people in Haiti, so poor, so miserable, you wouldn't want their life. And yet they're expecting the same reward as we're expecting, but look at the life we have here. We have this and we're going to heaven. Imagine how good God is. So he goes on, verse six and seven, he says, but you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? He says, you're guilty of sin if you give honor to someone who dishonors God and refuse to honor someone who does honor God. You know, he's talking about this rich and poor. The poor guy, he honors God, but you don't honor him. The rich guy maybe doesn't honor God, but him you will honor, why? Because he's rich. There's a good example of that. Christians today who spend money, big money, on concerts or other entertainments or sports figures, and these people live godless lives, they revel in public sin, but they refuse these same Christians who pour out their money to go observe these people and pay adulation to these people, these same people won't give a dime to help support the church's effort to assist the poor. What's wrong with that? Or Christians who love to be with other successful Christians, but they shy away from contact with brethren who are poor or who have handicaps or other kinds of limitations. Are we not making distinctions here? Verse eight, if however you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. So Jane remind, James reminds his readers of God's primary commands when referring to human relationships, a right and loving attitude towards everybody. That's the right way to go, he says. This, he says, guides our attitude 
in every situation. In verses 9 to 13 he continues, but if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty, for judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Kind of a long passage here. Basically he's saying God will not show mercy to those who are not themselves merciful. And he compares two law principles to make his point. First, the Ten Commandments, that's the judicial system. And then he talks about the law of liberty, that's the mercy system. These are two systems that he's comparing here. And he says, under the Ten Commandment system, if you failed in any one point of the commands, you were guilty of all. And sometimes we have trouble understanding, how does that work? You know, I, you know, I, I break the command not to steal, I'm, I'm guilty of adultery, you know, I didn't do adultery, how does that work? Well the point he's making here is that being under this type of system, if you broke one commandment, you might as well have broken all of them as far as the consequences are concerned. That's what he's saying. Now under the law of liberty, and what is the law of liberty? Well, that's Jesus, that's the gospel, salvation because of grace based on faith, not salvation based on performance. Under this law, he says, God forgives our failures because Jesus paid the price for them on the cross. You want to be under that system, he says. Now the requirement, however, is that to remain under the law of liberty, we also must be merciful towards others. This is an important part of the system. I've used this example before. I just haven't found a better one yet. You know, it's as if mercy is a you know, shower pouring down on you. And mercy's pouring down on you. And the idea is that if you don't you know, shower down mercy to the person below you, if you say, you know that person, that person doesn't deserve to live, that person offended me, I don't like that person, well I'm just going to shut off the valve that sends the mercy down to that person. Well I tell you, as you are shutting off the valve for mercy for that person, God is up there shutting off the valve for the mercy that comes down on you. Always remember that. The day that you refuse to give mercy to someone else is the day that God begins to refuse to give you mercy as well, because that's how the system works. Okay. Summary one, he says, to consider one brother more worthy of our love than another who is poor or different, that action, he says, that's unmerciful. This attitude removes us from the law of freedom and mercy for ourselves and puts us back under the law of judgment. And if that's the way we judge based on wealth and performance, then this is how God will judge us based on, based on our performance. Okay? So we should only have one attitude, he says, for all, and in the next couple of verses, James explains what this attitude should be. So let's keep going. He says, verse 14, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, and yet, you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. So here he repeats the idea expressed in the last chapter, you know, that true religion consists of mercy to the less privileged. Sincere faith, he says, the kind that's acceptable before God and thus the kind that saves us, he says this kind of faith manifests itself in good deeds. If the faith we have produces no good deeds, he says, then this is a sign that our faith is dead. 
and a dead faith has no power to save. For example, it's like a dead battery in a car. You see it, it's there, it's solid. It, you know, you, if you pick it up, it's got heft, it's got weight, you know, it's got matter, it takes up space, but if it's dead, it has no power to start the car. Same idea with faith. Verse 18, he continues, but someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. So James answers an imaginary argument here from a brother who might say, well look, I've got faith. And this brother tells him all the knowledge that he has about Christianity, he's read all the history books, all of the memory verses that he has. He sees himself as you know, a pretty religious person. And James responds to this person, well you show me your faith, you're showing it to me by explaining everything you know about Christ. And if you do this, then I will show you my faith, not by telling you everything I know, I will show you my faith by the good deeds that my faith provokes me to do in the name of Christ. Verse 19, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Point here is that mere knowledge of God, you know, things like, well, my, I remember when we were back in, in Canada, you know, we had people who didn't have a lot of background in the church, didn't know the Bible very well, and they would think that they were very religious because their wives were religious. They thought somehow they got some sort of cosmic dust <laughs> off of her religion, you know, that it sprinkled onto them somehow. Or I hear some people say, you know, who, who let's just say they're not all into their Christianity you know, to be kind. Well, my, my grandfather was an elder. And I say, yeah, that ain't going to get you to heaven. <laughs> you know, this idea that if, if somebody else in our family is religious, somehow that speaks well of us or that, that makes up for our lack of religion. The mere knowledge of God doesn't save us. And what he's saying here, you know, you know, the devil, he believes. And he believes in God, but he trembles because this knowledge does not produce repentance in him or good works. Therefore, this knowledge doesn't save him. He's condemned. You know, it, it, it's, not, it's not just the knowledge of Christ that saves. It's faith in Christ that saves. And faith working itself out in good works. So let's keep up with our passage. Verse 20, he says, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Faith as in mere understanding of the truth of Christianity without obedience to that faith is no good. It won't accomplish what faith is supposed to do. What is faith supposed to do? It's supposed to save you. That's what it's supposed to do. Yes, we're saved by faith, but if it is dead, meaning without works, well, it's dead, it won't save us. Verse 21 to 25, he continues and he says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son at the altar? You see that faith was working with his works and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. So he, he gives examples here. First example is Abraham. God promised him that the country that he was living in uh, one day would be, belong to him. I mean, he was a nomad, but God promised the country would belong to him. Promised him a great descendants. Uh, Abraham believed God's promises, and because of this, the Bible says, James says, God considered him to be acceptable in his sight. So this original faith was manifested throughout his life in many ways, but most especially when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son. He didn't have perfect obedience, only Jesus had perfect obedience, but he had a willingness to obey, a desire to obey. He had a pattern of obedience. I like what Marty says, so, so you know, he really nails it when he says, when he gives the example of him, he says, I, I'm, I'm not a perfect husband, but I'm a faithful husband. Yeah, that's, that's it, that's the idea. Abraham wasn't perfect, he didn't obey perfectly, his attitude was not perfect, he even made the same mistakes 
you know, over again. You know, he, he'd lie about you know, his relationship to his wife to get himself out of trouble or out of danger. Okay, you do it once, he did it twice. So Abraham wasn't a, the perfect man, but he was the faithful man. It was true, his faith, because it produced good works, a pattern of good works in his life. So good works perfect, meaning they bring to fruition faith. The only way faith becomes visible or tangible is through good works. We know that faith is perfected when sin is being abandoned, when good works are being done. This is how good works makes faith complete. It renders our faith visible and useful to God. You know when he says complete faith, perfect faith, what he's talking about is you know, how faithful do you have to be? Well, faithful enough so that other people can see that you're faithful. If the only person around, <laughs> if the only person around who thinks you're faithful is you, you have a ways to go. You know what I'm saying? There's still work to do here. It's like when we select elders. You say, elders, but they've got to be do this, they've got to do, they have to be hospitable, let's just say. You know, elders are hospitable. Well, just how hospitable do they have to be? You know, I mean, what, how do you measure a thing like that? So, so, well, hospitable enough that it's obvious that he's hospitable. Hospitable to the point where other people know that he's gracious and welcoming and you know, they, they know that about him. A man that's in control of himself. You know, no outbursts of anger, no, you know, no, no self-will. Well, just how much control is he? You know, Dr. Spock control? I mean, how, how much control does he need to have to qualify? Well, he needs to have enough self-control that other people notice that he has self-control. That other people notice he's not the type of man that just flies off the handle and goes off half-cocked on some crazy eye, you know? Enough that it shows. Well, the same thing. Faith is perfected how? Well, to the point where other people begin recognizing, hey, you're a woman of faith. You're a man of faith. Don't be shy and you know, false modesty if someone pays you a, a religious, you know, spiritual compliment like that. Say thank you. Be happy. Be happy that they recognize that there is something of spiritual worth that they see in you. It means that the Spirit of God is, you know, is succeeding in building things inside of you. Like that's a good thing. I would even go so far as to say that you know, God sent that person to help you realize that you're, that's an attaboy. That's an girl. So he goes on. Oh, well, hang on a second. Uh, one other thing. He says, not the kind of faith that just talks about religion or is interested in religious things, but the kind of faith that responds in love. And here's the thing. And love does not make any distinctions if we're going to stay within the context of you know, what we're studying here. All right, then he gives a second example of this, faith you know, and works. He says, in the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? So Rahab the prostitute who had faith, God does not make distinctions. God does not make distinctions. She lived in Jericho. She risked her life in order to hide Joshua's men who spied out the city before Joshua's capture of it. Her faith manifested itself how? In courage. Both Rahab and Abraham were found to be acceptable before God because of their faith. And their faith was acceptable before the Lord because why? Because it was fruitful. And because it was fruitful and real, they received the promises. Verse 26, he says, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, uh, so also faith without works is dead. So he describes a final image to underline his point. A body without breath, by the way, the same word here for spirit you know, in the Greek, that word breath, a body without breath is a sign that the body is, is dead. In the same way, 
a faith without good works is a sign that that faith is dead, useless. Remember, what's the point of faith? Well, the point of faith to save us. So lots of people in this world, you know, church buildings are full of them. Lots of people in this world have faith, but their faith is useless because it doesn't produce anything. There's nothing that comes of it. You got to have fruit. What does Jesus say? You know, those vines that don't grow any fruit, He prunes them back, gets rid of them. So the second summary, it doesn't matter if you're black or white, a Christian does not distinguish between brothers or sisters. He treats everyone in the same way because God treats every brother in the same way. I imitate Christ in this way. Secondly, he says, if his faith is alive, he will be active in good works, especially in kindness and mercy towards his brethren. Again, I keep going back to John, was it 1335? Jesus says, and this is the way that all men will know that you are my disciples, in the way that you love one another. Isn't that interesting? Because we have so many, I've heard so many sermons and so many books, you know, to prove who the true disciples are. You know? And yet Jesus in one verse, He says who are the true disciples. They're the ones who love one another. And I figure if I'm able to love you the way Christ loves me, I've gone a long way towards demonstrating the sincerity of my faith because if I'm able to do that with you, it means I'm able to do that with other people as well. So if his faith is alive, he'll be active in good works, especially in kindness and mercy towards his brother. He treats them the way God treats him. Think about this. Think of how bad we look before God. And if we get that picture in our mind, we'll never make any distinctions of other people ever again. Because let's face it, you know you, right? I know me, you know you, you know the good parts, but you also know all those ugly, dirty, nasty things you wouldn't want anybody to know about you, but God knows that. And yet, He sends you those spiritual attaboys. <laughs> he answers your prayers, He gives you life. He promises eternal life. If our faith doesn't produce obedience towards God or mercy towards our brethren and others or a witness concerning the Lord and the gospel to other people, James says it's a dead faith. It won't save us in the end. Thirdly, he says um, the best way to tell your, um, the best way to test your faith rather, whether it's alive or dead, is to take the say and do test. Does what you say match what you do? There's seven of them. So the first one is, if you, you say, you know, we say we love God, but do we obey and trust Him? Second one, we say we believe the gospel, but do we share it with other people? You know, if we have a good recipe for raisin bread, we're, we're ready to share that. Or if we like our hairdresser, or our doctor, or dentist, oh, you got to see my dentist, he's the best, no pain, you know. How about, the, how about the person who's going to give us eternal life? How about sharing him? We say we love the church, but when was the last time we called or visited or helped or fed or prayed for the brother or sister sitting right next to us or behind us? Or are we distinguishing between those who are the same or different than we are? Sometimes you know, it's not just different like male, female, or you know, black, white. Sometimes they have a different opinion. <laughs> they have a different character. They're a different generation. Sometimes that's the difference. We say we want the church to grow, but what have we sacrificed for it? And will we sacrifice to establish maybe a new one? Jesus gave His blood. What are we willing to give? You know, these are the questions. We say that we want to grow in Christ, but are we faithful to the assembly and personal study and prayer? You know, just measure you know, how, much, how much time spent observing 
mostly, I don't want to generalize, observing mostly unbelieving, sinful entertainers do their thing versus how much time we spent reading God's word, reading or thinking or you know, listening to material that builds us up spiritually. I mean, all this adulation to some of the female singers and yet I, I, I see it in the paper sometimes. They just have a picture in the paper about one of the leading female artists and they're dressed like prostitutes, worse than prostitutes. A hundred years ago, it wouldn't have been permitted in public. It would have been scandalous. Now, pff, nothing there, nothing there. People spend $300, $200 to go drink in two hours of this stuff. And yet you can't get them to come to Bible study. No, no, that's, that's, too, that's too painful. We say we want our children to become Christians, but do we bring them to Sunday school? Do we encourage them to have Christian friends? Do we insist that they go to camp? Say and do, say and do. We say we want to go to heaven, but have we obeyed the gospel? Are we living in sin? Are we putting off till tomorrow, giving up sinful habits, friends, whatever? Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die and nobody wants to change. <laughs> That's the problem. So the question is, you know, is our faith alive or dead? Because as our faith is, so are we. As our faith is, so are we. Remember I said James, he gets to the point, yeah, he gets to the point. No mincing of words. Please don't say, wow, well, well, uh, Mazzalongo was right. He was into it. What did he have for supper? No. You just, just follow. Just follow the verses down. It's an easy book to teach because the, the theology is not complicated. You, you don't have to have you know, a big, long explanation of how it's worked. He's so direct, boom. I mean, I could almost just read the passage. So for us, of course, the important thing always, remember I said to you a while back, it's always about faith. I keep repeating, it. it's always about faith. Everything's always about faith. <coughs> James confirms it here. It's always about faith. And the tests that we go through and the trials that we go through many times are simply to examine, how's your faith? Is it alive? Here, you know, you want to stimulate religious discussion among the brethren? You want to, um, uh, be a little more evangelistic, but you don't know how to start. You don't want to sound like, you know, do you believe in Jesus? You know, you know people say, so how you doing? What's up? You know? <laughs> <laughs> how about, how's your faith? How's your faith doing? You ever say to a brother or sister, you know, oh, good morning, nice, yeah, well, boom, yeah, you're here, blah, blah, blah. So how, how's your spiritual life coming along? You'd be surprised the answer you would get if you asked that question. It's almost as if the person is saying, thank God somebody finally asked me. Try it, give it a shot. We're not going to ask for hands, and we're gonna, it's not a, it won't be on the report card. Just try it for your own edification, just try that. See what happens. All right, that's our lesson about Michael Jackson and James. Next time we're going to do teaching teachers tongues. We're going to go to tongues. And if you think he's brutal here, oh boy, wait till you get to the next section. So, all right, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>